I'm going to talk about getting super clean igrams. How to go from this to this. Mostly this video is about finding and cleaning dust, but at the end I talk about some other things to get really crisp igrams. There's a table of contents in the comments below this video to help you jump to whatever part of the video you want. So here is an igram with some dust rings caused by dust somewhere in the optics. This dust ring here resulted in a bump on the wavefront when processed in DFT fringe. That bump is not caused by a defect on the mirror, but by dust on the bath somewhere. This other bit of dust caused a smaller bump. Sometimes dust rings don't seem to affect the wavefront image at all, like these other two. This igram isn't all that bad. Dale Eason, who created DFT Fringe, usually does quite a few igrams at different tilts which moves the dust around. And more importantly, he tends to do eight rotations of his mirror if he wants a really accurate wavefront that doesn't show any dust. But getting rid of most of the dust usually isn't a lot of work. The first step is to figure out where the dust is. The semiconductor laser will not have any issues, but the collimating lens in the laser can be a problem along with the splitter, the flat, and the diverger. And actually even the surface of your mirror possibly. It took me dozens of cleanings before I realized I was often cleaning the wrong optic. So here I have the bath set up normal, but instead of pointing it at a mirror, I point it at a white piece of paper. I have this box I made out of black cardboard so that I can test various optics during the daytime next to a window. But instead, we'll just get by with a room with dim lighting and a piece of paper taped to the wall. Now we have a split screen where the inset video shows the overhead view of what I am doing to the bath at the same moment as you can see the beams projected onto the wall. So let me rotate the diverger into the left beam, which is the test beam. Let's forget about the reference beam for now, so I'll aim that away by rotating the flat. I purposely added dust to all the optics for this demonstration. We'll start with the laser. If I rotate it, any dust that rotates is obviously from the laser. If you have this type of laser where you focus it by turning the collimating lens, then you can just rotate it a little bit and see if the dust rotates. Here's another laser type that focuses with rotation. But if you have this type, do not rotate the end. You can, and it will rotate the collimating lens, but it's a bad idea as you will almost certainly scratch the collimating lens, which is plastic in this type of laser, with a spring that pushes up against the lens. Instead, make sure the laser is a little loose in its holder and rotate the entire laser. So for example, these six spots are from the laser. Notice how they rotate when I rotate the focuser. Let's do the diverger next. When you move the diverger, it's the dust that doesn't move that is on the diverger. This is very counterintuitive. You'd think if you are moving the diverger and nothing else, then the spots from the diverger would move. To prove it, I'll remove it, and using two hands, I can rotate it enough to be sure. So these six spots rotated and are part of the diverger. Screwing the diverger back onto the bath and moving it, I can now see that the diverger spots didn't move. Any remaining spots in this test beam are from the splitter, either the laser side or the projection side. Okay, keep your eye on these two spots as I rotate the splitter. The left spot is on the left side of the splitter, the side closest to the laser. The right spot is on the projection side of the splitter, the side normally closest to the mirror being tested. Consider pausing and backing up the video to see this a few more times. I find it interesting that you can actually differentiate all four of these, laser, left side of splitter, projection side of splitter, and diverger, all just by rotating the cube. It's unusual to have so much dust on so many surfaces, but since I do have so much, you can see the four different movements. When I rotate the splitter clockwise as seen from above, dust on the projection side of the splitter, the splitter side towards the paper I taped on the wall, those spots move not at all, or they move the least amount. Dust spots on the diverger move to the right. Spots on the laser move to the left. Spots on the laser side of the splitter move to the left, but faster than the laser spots. What I just said is summarized in the description below this video, 
in case you want to print out this bit of wisdom. If you look at this diagram of the bath, note that it is rotated 90 degrees from the overhead inset view you were just looking at. The laser now is at the top and the mirror to the right. Actually, that's where we project onto paper. You can access this tool yourself by writing down this same URL that you see here on my web browser. If I rotate the cube, you can see that for the laser side of the cube, the beam goes through different parts of the cube. So the beam will travel across the dust and the dust will appear to move. But on the right side of the cube facing the mirror, the test beam, these red lines, pretty much just go through the same spot of the cube, so the dust doesn't really move. This is true because of the index of refraction of the glass that makes up the cube. If I set the IOR to 1 here, which is the same as air, then the beams aren't refracted and you get a result that dust would indeed pass across the laser beam. But back to real life, the index of refraction of glass is around 1.5. This agrees with what we saw a minute ago. Similarly, at the bottom of the cube, as we will see in a minute, the blue beam, the reference beam, passes through the same spot of the cube even when I rotate the cube. Now let's bring this reference beam back in and aligned normally. Under normal use, keep the beams roughly parallel. And now I'll move the diverger over to the reference beam. This is not how I normally recommend you use a bath. When using a bath to test a mirror, it will work fine in this configuration, but you are more likely to clip one of the beams in the splitter if you do it this way. Anyway, now we can look for additional dust on the right side of the cube, facing the flat, and we can look for dust on the flat. At this point, normally you have cleaned all the surfaces, so there is no distracting dirt. But here it's getting crazy with five surfaces that I've made dirty. I think at this point it's best to just consult the notes in the description of the video below. But here I'll mark some dust spots related to each of the five surfaces. And you can see that if I rotate the cube, rotate the laser, and move the diverger, these five types of spots move in different directions. So if you really want to see what it looks like, keep pausing and going back and follow each type of dust. But in reality, hopefully, you only have one spot to clean, not dozens. And you can rotate the laser, then move the diverger, then rotate the cube to isolate where the spot is. Note that the bright laser dot moves right when I rotate the splitter clockwise. Let's talk about cleaning. I am by no means an expert but I have cleaned hundreds of lenses. If you have a laser with a plastic lens, you are probably out of luck. If you get acetone on it for more than a second or so, you will fog it up and ruin it. If you get alcohol on it for just a few seconds, it will be fine. I recommend using a Q-tip and cut the end to get it to a sharp point and fold some cotton over the tip and stick that into the front of the laser and spin it around. A dry Q-tip. If you absolutely have to clean it, you can take it apart, but very likely you will scratch it with a spring. Get a laser with a glass lens next time. You don't have to be nearly as gentle with these glass lenses as you do with a telescope mirror. Any techniques for that will work for these, but I use much rougher techniques. Good solvents are soap and water or isopropyl alcohol. I have used acetone, which works fine, but anything that the other techniques can't clean won't do any better with acetone. Isopropyl alcohol is the best simply because it dries much faster. If you use soap and water, use deionized or distilled water, at least for the final rinse. Tap water has so much dirt in it that you will just be adding dirt and moving it around each time. I just use ordinary liquid hand soap or sometimes dishwashing soap. If there is a fingerprint, then there are oils, and you must use soap and water or, alternatively, isopropyl alcohol. But most of the time, you can just use a puff of air or a dry Q-tip. 90% of the time, I just use a dry Q-tip. Especially on a lens that you already got clean in the past, you can usually use a dry Q-tip. You can be quite rough. The odds that you will scratch the lens because there is some sand in the Q-tip is unlikely, and these lenses are not expensive. I have cleaned over 100 tiny lenses and never caused a scratch. I haven't needed to clean my flats, 
but I've done it anyway on rare occasions. I have only tried ethyl alcohol on flats, and I've been more cautious because I don't know how tough the mirror coating is. But again, you can get one of these quite cheap if you ruin it. Here I'll show you my technique with ethyl alcohol. It looks like we are being watched. Hmm. Wash your hands with soap first to reduce the odds of transferring oil onto the Q-tip and then onto the lens, or directly onto the lens. Also consider using gloves, but they aren't mandatory. I like to set up things so that I can put the lens into the laser light and see if it's clean before remounting the lens. So looking at my interferometer, you can see that I took the cube out and I moved the laser from here to here. Dale's design of the bath seems to have an extra screw hole here. It's useful for testing while cleaning a single lens. So here are two bad, uncleanable lenses. Needle nose pliers are easier to use than fingers. You are less likely to smudge the lens and your fingers stay out of the way. This lens here is not cleanable. All these circles with a bright center, these are caused by defects in the anti-reflective coating. I've had to throw away many of these, but this lens was only about $2. A bath interferometer doesn't need a diverger with an anti-reflective coating, so I tried to remove it. I had no luck. The coating is very tough. Recently, I bought a special chemical to remove the coating, and someday I will try it out. If I am successful, I will post details in a fresh comment or maybe in the description below this video. This other lens is even worse. Again, bad coating. I have about a hundred of these useless divergers. 70% ethyl alcohol, nitrile gloves. So let's clean this diverger we've been looking at. These air bulbs are great. Puff, 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 puff. So much better. Always have a clean tissue to work over in case you drop the lens or you are forced to put the lens down. The tissue will sometimes add some dust when the lens touches it, so I try to put a clean lens directly back into its mounting without putting it down. So here I pull the mounting apart and tap it a bit. It's made of very tough and flexible nylon. You just want the Q-tip only partially wetted. This is much too much. This is too much. Sometimes less is more. I touch the lens only by the edges. Use the wet side of the Q-tip and spin the Q-tip at the same time as I rotate the lens with my fingers. I'm rotating the lens because otherwise the Q-tip doesn't reach all the edges. The other hand is spinning the Q-tip to rub the glass firmly. Then I flip the Q-tip over end for end and repeat the process to dry it off. This is like cleaning a plate with a dirty sponge. The dirt usually sticks to the sponge and not the plate. Next I use the dry side of the Q-tip to assist flipping the lens over and repeat the process on the other side. It appears the alcohol didn't dry thoroughly, so I use the air bulb, which usually dries the alcohol in just a few seconds. So this looks worse than before. Frustrating, but I know this lens was once much cleaner, so I'll try again with a fresh Q-tip. This time with much less alcohol. There are particles in the alcohol, so less is more. Much better. Maybe good enough. We only need to clean within this circle, a circle that is centered on the usable part of the beam. Let's do one more pass, but with only the dry side of the Q-tip. Sometimes I sniff both ends to figure out which end of the Q-tip is the dry side. I think I got the center good, but wasn't careful to get the edges. 
That's good enough. I see three spots, but they aren't too bad. Fainter than average. That line at the top is just a hair that will puff away after I mount it, if it doesn't fall off in the process of mounting it. So with one hand, you can do a three-point squeeze, but I'm just going to lay it in flat. <laughs> Oops. So don't touch it with your finger, but with the Q-tip should be fine. Then pull the sides apart carefully and it slides in. Sometimes I have to push it in while spreading the holder. Look straight in and make sure it isn't crooked. I usually push it gently with my finger now, and sometimes it wiggles a little, which is fine. Sometimes it takes two or three tries. Let's test it. Unfortunately, I have the other camera turned off. Looks great. Looks really great. So that was typical. It took three tries to clean this lens. Again, try and use just air puffs first, then try just a dry Q-tip. Alcohol usually isn't needed unless you see grease. At the far extreme, sometimes I soak the lens in the cap of the isopropyl alcohol for five minutes before starting, but very rarely. And now for a few more tips. I'm about to talk about focusing the laser, focusing the camera, tilting the laser, using a polarizer, not overexposing, and tilting the splitter. If your laser is focused at infinity, that's good enough. But if you can easily focus it on the mirror, that's even better, according to the experts. Focus the dot as small as possible. One side benefit is that the unremovable laser dot in your iGram photo will be much smaller. More importantly, focus your camera on the mirror. I turn up the lights and turn up the ISO and turn down the shutter speed and focus on the edge of the mirror. Here is an example of an unfocused versus a focused iGram. Note how the fringes suddenly tilt just past the edge of the mirror. Also note the dark lines paralleling the edge of the mirror. You can't trust the results of an unfocused iGram. The inexpensive beam splitters used in most bath interferometers polarize the laser light into two separate beams. Each beam polarization is 90 degrees from the other. If you set up your laser, cube, flat, and diverger like this diagram, you can see that the test beam, red lines, bounces 90 degrees off the splitter before going through the diverging lens. And when it returns back from the mirror, it bounces off the splitter again. But the reference beam, blue lines, goes straight through the cube both times. So the test beam is polarized one way, and the reference beam has the remaining light, which means that light is polarized mostly the other way. So the test and reference beams are polarized 90 degrees from each other. So here I have a polarizing filter on my camera. These are inexpensive. Make sure the size of the filter matches the size shown on your camera lens. For example, this lens takes a 62 millimeter diameter polarizer. You can see I got it on Amazon Basics, and I think I paid $12. Here I'm starting with the polarizer at 45 degrees. Notice how dark the dark fringes are, as that will change. Notice that we can see both the reference beam, the background, and the test beam, which shows us the mirror itself. The two beams combine to make the interferogram. Now as I rotate the polarizer, notice first that the reference beam fades out. The background fades out. The iGram may look better at this point, but now notice how the dark fringes fade out and have lower contrast. Also, I like being able to see the reference beam, so I can tell if I'm approaching the edge of the reference, which can give me a bad iGram. Okay, I rotate back to the ideal position, and now let's keep going the other way. Now the test beam is fading out. At some point, you can just barely see the iGram. You can still see it because the fringes are moving, but if I freeze the video, you would be hard-pressed to find the iGram. Now let me remove the polarizing filter. You can see that the contrast isn't as good without the polarizing filter. Having the polarizing filter will also help you see fringes when they are very close together. It's worth the $12. If you don't have a polarizing filter, you can see the exact same issues by tilting the entire laser. The light coming from the laser is actually already polarized. If the circuit board is vertical and the beam coming out looks horizontal, 
then you will have trouble seeing the reference beam. If you rotate the circuit board horizontal so that the beam appears vertical, you will have trouble seeing the iGram from the background noise. I recommend you put the laser at 45 degrees, especially if you are also using a polarizing filter. I did some experiments for this video with no polarizing filter and with the laser tilted different amounts and it didn't make much of a difference in contrast, so you really don't need to get it accurately tilted to 45 degrees. As long as you are at least 20 degrees off of vertical or horizontal, your iGrams will be fine. Next topic, don't overexpose your iGrams. This should be obvious, but I do it by accident all the time. If you use the histogram feature to check for overexposure with normal daylight photography, you can tell it is overexposed when the histogram reaches the right edge here. But with iGrams, the laser is only in one color, usually red. So when only the red sensor is overexposed, the other two sensors see nothing, so the histogram looks okay. It goes out one-third from the left edge. Well, one-third from the left edge is too much, because that implies the red pixels are overexposed. In DFT Fringe, you can click Show Intensity Graph. If you are overexposing, then you will see flat tops on these sine waves. This is overexposed. This is not. It's not a disaster if you overexpose. You will get something we call print through, as shown here, but you can just increase the Gaussian filter size until it goes away. Still, why not simply lower the exposure? And my final advice, rotate your splitter. Even though most splitters are coded, you still get some internal reflections and you end up with two dots coming back towards the camera. You can see these even if there's no mirror in the test stand. The two dots can mess up your iGram somewhat, not a disaster, but they are easy to move to the side, so why not? If you rotate your cube about a degree, that will move the dots off of the interferogram. For a really low F number mirror, an F2, you need to rotate the splitter 2 degrees. For an F4, just 1 degree is enough. So basically, rotate the splitter just the tiniest amount that you can still make out visually. I sell bath interferometers. If you go to gr5.org slash bath, I I have lots of advice if you're making your own interferometer, um, or you can just buy one from me. You just click on this link. It takes you to my newer store. I just put up a newer store recently. This is in 2022, and I guess it's slow. And um, I have this cool thing to help you select parts here. So if let's say you're testing like a, an F4 mirror and an F5 mirror, um, and that's kind of the range of what you're going to be testing, now you have kind of two options. You can choose the cheaper laser or the laser that's $14 more. I, I recommend the glass laser. It's just a better laser. It's easier to clean and stuff. Um, these, But anyway, the other thing is with this combination, I recommend you get two different uh, divergers, which is going to cost you an extra $10. So really this is only $4 more in this one ex specific example. But let's say you choose this laser, and then and you could have added a lot more um, mirrors. And then you can go in through here and you can see the price is uh, $209. You can save $50 if you do this. You're down $159. Um, and then you can hit add to cart and so on if you want. Or you can email me with questions. I do ship internationally. Um, it may have an issue with that if your country isn't in my list yet. But just email me if it comes up that way. It'll tell you to email me. So, so that's it. I hope you like this video.